welcome to the second in the series. Uh, we're going to be talking about the end of the official role of the mistress today. Now, last week we looked at the function of the official mistress in French, it's the maîtresse en titre, uh, what she brought uh, to the reign uh, of the king to whom she was uh, the consort, I suppose, in some ways. We spoke um, in particular about the Marquise de Montespan because she epitomized uh, what the royal mistress was. Remember, she came from very high birth, and this is something that is important to remember today because we're actually going to look at the end of the idea of the royal mistress, and it's going to have something to do with uh, birth. Secondly, she had to be someone who was very cultured, someone who had great esprit. Remember, this was the, the age of the Enlightenment that we're talking about, where the art of conversation, um, the art of ideas, discussing ideas lightly, cleverly, condensing language and so on, was also extremely important. But more than that, that the, uh, the favourite was supposed to be a kind of part of the spectacle of the court uh, and to enhance the gloire, remember we talked about that, um, of the king of Louis XIV. Uh, he was extremely proud of his mistress as he was proud um, of his uh, chateau uh, at Versailles. So uh, the role of the first mistress was to uh, export the image of French sophistication, fashion, wit, and culture. Now, we talked about the other role which was held, and this is again the main point of this lecture is going to be about the different roles and how they finally diminish. Uh, the other role that the king was related to was of course that of the, with the queen. Now the queen was by almost by definition a foreigner. So when we actually start to talk about Marie Antoinette and the idea that you know she was victimized because she was a foreigner is really quite ridiculous. Uh, the whole point of marriage, dynastic marriage and marriage into other countries was that you stop warfare or you annex territory via marriages. So therefore the queen was practically always a foreigner, uh, often didn't master uh, French very well and uh, had her own court uh, around her. The Queen, however, was never partook of the royalty of the King. She was simply his first subject, uh, and her duty, she had very specific duties, was to produce an heir. So through her body, she produced the children of France, who really didn't belong to her, they belonged to France, just as the French King belonged to France, or symbolised France. So the Queen was sort of an adjunct, and once she had fulfilled this role of producing the next series of kings, she was not exactly superfluous, but uh, her role had been fulfilled. And she was therefore supposed to retire and represent um, the eternal values of the monarchy, which were uh, virtue uh, and piety, uh, and to play this secondary role, and certainly not to um, demand individuality. She was simply a cipher in this royal system. Uh, and so the, this queen that we were speaking about last, uh, last week and one of the queens that we'll speak about this week um, fulfilled this role perfectly. Now, um, what was interesting with Louis XIV, of course, after having gone from this glittering representation uh, of, uh, of his mistress, he finally ended up going slightly down market, if you'd like to sort of use the expression, insofar as he ended up with um, a woman whom he could marry, therefore the whole problem of sin and everything was avoided, avoided and his soul therefore was uh, saved. But she came from very, very much lesser nobility, if at all, however she sort of just got in by the skin of her teeth. However, when we get to Louis the Fifteenth we find that he now has taken a mistress, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about Madame de Pompadour, who uh, fulfills very well this role of uh, official mistress, uh, in fact does it brilliantly, 
However, she is a bourgeoise. In other words, she has to be presented at court and she has to be married off into, artificially, uh, into a, a, a semi-noble family and be given titles and lands. After she has gone, the king, who, whose personality we'll look at in a moment, um, oh, thanks, Davina, uh, goes really down market and uh, chooses as his next royal mistress a woman who is a common prostitute, uh, who is very beautiful but is then presented at the court uh, and uh, continues to downgrade this role. So by the time Madame de Barry has sort of giggled her way around the court, um, not only does she have no wit, she has no brain, she has no class, she has no breeding, and she certainly doesn't bring any gloire to the court, but the king, who at the age of 60, says, oh, she's wonderful, she makes me feel like a young man, so we won't go into all of that. <laughs> all right, so um, for reasons that we will go into, by the time his grandson, Louis XVI, comes to power, um, the coffers of the uh, realm have been emptied by Louis XV. Politically, it is not expedient now to have a very showy mistress, and also because of Louis XVI's personality. And so it is the queen, Marie Antoinette, also because of her particularly the capricious style of, of personality, is going to take over the role of king, uh, queen and first mistress, and in doing so degrades the status of the queen to such an extent uh, that she is effectively the last queen. Right? It, the way in which she behaves um, under, undercuts the eternal prestigious nature um, of monarchy to such an extent that it just becomes um, an everyday thing which can be dispensed with um, as it was to happen under the revolution. So um, we're not saying that this is all her fault, but um, she contributes vastly to the extinction of the of royalty because of her behaviour and of taking on this role of individuality, which of course a queen was not supposed to have. So I want to now turn then to uh, Louis XV, Le Bien-Aimé. Right? He was the beloved for a long time until when he finally dies and has, as I said before, bankrupt the kingdom. Uh, he's no longer considered as such. Now, um, he, not, not unlike Henry II, uh, if you remember, uh, he came to power. He is the great-grandson of Louis XIV. And there are a series of circumstances that bring this little boy to power. Here in 1710, we have a family portrait of Louis XIV um, with, an, well, his own generation, the next, the next, and the next. It looks like four generations. <coughs> he has <coughs> assured himself, the, the realm um, of great continuity. Um, just after uh, this painting was, was produced, the Dauphin dies, uh, either of peritonitis or, or unexpectedly, and a year later, the wife um, of the next in, in line, this is the uh, Duke of Bourgogne, uh, his wife catches measles. And of course, measles at that time uh, was often lethal. Uh, he is devastated, sits by her bed, she dies, and a couple of days later, he dies. Uh, so the children, of course, have been in contact with him, and this little boy, also is going to die. Now this isn't Louis the Fifteenth. This is Louis uh, Louis the Fifteenth's eldest elder brother, mm -hmm. right? Who's, who Louis uh, had only just been born at the time. So um, the lady here who has hold of him is the governess, Madame de Montadour. She has the little reins holding him up. Mm -hmm. um, but all of these children, whenever you actually had any illness, the classic treatment was bleeding. Uh, and enemas and bleeding and enemas and look if the illness didn't kill you that certainly would and the only reason that the little Louis XV survives is that this particular governess is so horrified at what happens to this little child that she barricades herself in her apartment with two maids and a supply of food for about a week and will not let anyone in and actually uh, saves Louis XV right 
otherwise the entire royal family, four generations, or at least three next generations would have been wiped out within a number of months. So Louis XIV then uh, bequeaths his throne to his great-grandson. Now he is brought up in Versailles. Uh, here he is as the boy king at the age of 15. And he is given as a uh, regent. Now, think back to last week, right? The Duke d'Orléans. Do you remember that Louis XIV had a brother who was sort of uh, gay, bisexual, right? And his son is going to be the regent, but his son marries Marie-Françoise de Bourbon, who was the daughter, illegitimate daughter of Madame de Montespan. Okay, which means that the regent is actually at the same time the nephew and the son-in-law of Louis the Fourteenth. So remember this the way in which you had all these people coalescing. And uh, had had the child died, the uh, crown would have gone into the Orléans family branch. All right, now this little boy um, is brought up then, uh, taken away from his governesses at the age of seven, forced uh, to, to learn immense amounts uh, with tutors, uh, and all his life um, will be sh very good. He's very good looking, but he's very shy, um, slightly depressed, sort of melancholy, uh, constantly seeks out um, the company of women. Uh, and it, not particularly beautiful women, but women who can um, make him feel at ease. And he grows up, of course, he inherits this enormous sort of, uh, well, I don't know what you call kind of city, um, which is Versailles, which is built for prestige, which is built to stun, but certainly not for comfort, for intimacy or anything like that. And he's forced to go through this extraordinary ritual where he is constantly on show. Um, when he's getting up, when he's going to bed, when he's going to the toilet, um, everyone has their rights to actually be sort of opening the, you know, the, the, the commode. Um, but other people have the right to close the commode. Other people, um, everyone has the right to come and watch him eat. So this idea of perpetually being on display is something that he finds very, very, very difficult. So he's a rather secretive, um, depressive character who always needs to be amused and who really isn't interested in government either. Uh, he's going to, that's going to be left to his ministers. So this is this majestic, cold, formal environment that he is going to want constantly to escape. Now, when he's very young, um, they, people want, of course, to assure the next generation of the Bourbon, you know, who Louis XIV had brought France to be the most important uh, city, uh, most important country in Europe. Uh, and it was unthinkable uh, that, uh, that there would be no further king. So she's married off, what was it, a fiancé to little Maria Victoria, who was seven, from Spain. She's brought up to the court, he's 11, and then people sort of look at her and think, you know, it's going to be a few years before she can produce um, another generation. So she's packed off back to Spain, and they search around and rummage around the, the courts of Europe for um, a queen who can actually reproduce and will also um, bring new territories and alliances uh, into France. And they find um, Maria Lesnivska. Now, I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing that properly. Am I? Um, she's the uh, daughter of the Polish king, an impoverished uh, uh, king. She's rather plain, but let's face it, most of the queens were. It didn't sort of really seem, didn't matter because that wasn't what you were looking for. Uh, she's extremely pious, uh, and she would make an excellent wife. Now, uh, here we have her in the role that a queen is supposed to play. She is always pictured um, in the gaze. You can't unfortunately see it here, but there's always in royal portraits of a queen the gaze of the king, because that is who she is. That, that is where she takes her power or prestige from, the reflected glory of the king. Um, the king, you might have noticed before, has his legs sort of stuck out and all sort of showing off his muscles, you know, and the, the, the cape is rippling and movement. The queen is utterly, utterly still um, uh, in a kind of vertical uh, pillar construction. You know, she is solidity, the virtue um, behind the throne. And of course, the little um, papillon, I think it's a papillon dog, 
there, um, symbolizing fidelity as well. Now, um, she is an extremely, she does her job very well. Louis the has been told, you've got to get on with the job and produce heirs, and he, boy, does he do it. Um, he produces, I think in something like 11 years, he ends up with nine children. There were, there were two, uh, one set of twins, but you can imagine poor old Mary Lewinsky, virtually constantly pregnant. In the end, she gets rather sick of this, and uh, so on saints' days won't have anything to do with him, and then there's, she's always sick or she's doing something else, and finally Louis XV gets the hint and um, decides he needs an official um, mistress. In the meantime, she, he's had, unfortunately, mainly girls, uh, and by the time he's had the eighth girl, Madame the First, they, that's what they were called, Madame the First, Madame the Second, Madame the Third, and he got to Madame the Eighth, and he said, that's Madame the Last. <laughs> Uh, now these poor little madams, uh, the last four of them were sent off to convents, one will die there, another one enters the Order of Carmel, one is married, uh, one dies, and the rest of them, uh, particularly three of them, these three, uh, Victoire, Adelaide and Sophie, remain at the court and they're going to be a great thorn in the side of the little Dauphine, Marie Antoinette, when she is married to their uh, great nephew. Now, um, he decides then, this, he's a very sort of attractive man, again, like Louis XIV, supposed to be the most handsome man uh, in France. Um, and uh, the thing about royal mistresses is that they don't just happen. He isn't walking along one day and sees someone beautiful and thinks, oh, look, I'll invite her out to dinner. These women um, are positioned at court by powerful factions. Uh, who want power, and by introducing these mistresses, that hoping that the mistress will be grateful to them, and through the mistress they then will be given the position, perhaps a foreign minister, or a minister for the interior, and so on. And so you have these powerful factions, one of which is the Comte de Fleury and the Comte de Richelieu. So Fleury um, has, knows this family of the Mai, in which there were five girls. <laughs> Five. Right. And the first one to be presented at court is Louis Julie de Nel, who they all have to be married, by the way, to so that they can have an affair with the king. And uh, she's uh, a relatively nice sort of person, quite devoted to the king, uh, not brilliant, but you know she she sort of more or less fulfills the role, uh, even though she's nothing like what Madame de Pompadour will be, and is very comfortable in her role until she makes the ghastly error. Of, um, she's of course given castles and jewels and so on, the ghastly error of introducing her younger sister who has been in the convent and sort of has complained bitterly and she thinks what well, should bring her to court. Now she was evidently terribly ugly, this, um, these, nez, these first two Nesling sisters uh, were supposed to have a face like a horse and um, rather masculine and galumping. But anyway, um, the king is delighted with her to the extent where he keeps the other sister um, as well as sort of the official mistress and, and has her as well. This one um, dies uh, in childbirth. So, while they're in mourning, or the elder sister is in mourning, um, she invites, she obviously wasn't very bright, she obviously hadn't learned any lesson at all, <laughs> and she invites her two of her younger sisters to court. And this is where it really gets interesting now. Um, Anne-Marie de Nel, knew how to play the king, so she appeared in mourning and he sort of, his eyes lit up, you know, oh, there's a third one. Um, oh no, she says, look, I'm already in love with someone else, you know, this is this wonderful warrior. Oh, says Louis, I'll fix that, so he's sent off uh, into, into battle. Unfortunately, comes back unscathed, um, <laughs> and so they, he arranges this very complex thing where um, he sends her off. To, he sends him off to the provinces, and then forges a whole lot of love letters that he's supposed to receive, and gives them to Madame de Chateau, saying, "Look, he's been unfaithful to you. Why don't you take me instead?" And she says, "Oh, maybe, right." So they're both playing an elaborate game, but she makes a lot of conditions. She makes the condition is that she has to be made a duchess. Now that, as we know, is the highest rank uh, that you can can be in court and actually not be the, a king or a queen. Uh, and it usually was only for the princes of blood um, who could um, be um, a, a duchess. 
She also demands that her eldest sister be sent away. All right, so she gets the eldest sister sent away, the eldest sister goes and does what everyone, you know, ex-mistress does, and that's enter a convent. Right. So um, she then rapes Supreme, really Supreme, going off on all of the influencing uh, foreign policy, influencing the position of who gets what ministership. Um, however, it starts to come unstuck when uh, Louis XIV is, is, uh, is actually pushed into a war uh, in, in Flanders. Uh, against his wishes, I mean, but uh, Madame de Chateau says, you've got to be a great warrior, you know, like your great-grandfather, you know, pushes him to do this. Um, and he, he catches some kind of, it's not smallpox, but one of these diseases, and it looks as though he's going to die. So the confessors come along and say, you can't possibly die in sin, get rid of your mistress. So reluctantly, the <laughs> little thing sends her away, and her carriage is being stoned by people who, you know, don't like her, but at this stage, she's known as arrogant. And unfortunately, Louis then gets better uh, and uh, goes back on his vow and goes back to Paris and, and is about to set up house again with Madame de Chateauroux when she dies mysteriously in the night. We don't know what of. Clearly somebody um, got to her before. Now, she, she actually was supposed also to have had kept her charm over Louis XV by arranging threesomes with her fourth sister. <laughs> All right, so when she dies, for a while, um, the um, Louis XV consoles himself um, for a number of months with the fourth sister, who is, either isn't nasty enough or isn't whatever it is, but just doesn't pack it. And the fifth sister by now thinks, look, I'm, I'm in for it too. I'm, she actually left and lived in the provinces. So this is very interesting. So in other words, you've already got a, a, a personality characteristic of Louis XV. He's sort of a laziness uh, in many ways. It's sort of not someone who is actually going, he's always had to be pushed to do everything. He's going to be advised to do things. He's not something someone like his grandfather. It's a bit like in the French department, in the Italian department, people, they always had affairs with people in the next office. <laughs> you know, it was, it was amazing. I was next to the photocopy office and I, and I had a gay guy on the other side, so there was no hope for me. But um, it, it was really interesting. And then the German department, oh, this has got nothing to do with it. <laughs> right. So um, this meant that there was an opening for um, a new mistress. And one was being groomed. Uh, as these people, for example, like the Duchess of Cambridge, these, these women, they're, they're groomed for the part right from the time they're young. And this is Jeanne, Jeanne Antoinette Poisson, which is an unfortunate name and will haunt her um, in these diatribes in the gutter press, um, which is always the, the gutter press diatribes against her, all called Poissonade, you know, fish flinging mm -hmm. aspects. Um, she was born to a very minor tax collector, you know, and um, quite a beautiful woman. And it is thought that the poor old tax collector, who happened to be after she was born, was sent off to ta collect taxes in some far-flung part of France, or if not overseas. And she was brought up um, in a convent um, and given the most expensive education that anyone could possibly have if you were at the court, in fact probably better than if you're at the court. And so the reason for this is that it, there are two possibilities. Um, she had two godfathers. One of them was uh, Charles-François-Paul Le Normand de Tournerin, who was a very wealthy uh, entrepreneur. And also these one of the brothers, the Paris brothers, the Montmartel, these were people who weren't nobles, but were the ones who actually bankrolled the um, royal armies, uh, bought the horses, bought the provisions. These were very, very important people uh, and who wanted access, direct access to the king rather than having to pass through middlemen. So part of this was to produce someone at what is called a morceau du roi, you know, a king's little morsel, uh, and to put her in his way so that they could then have the ear of the king and come to power. And indeed, this is what's going to happen. So um, Madame, de, um, Madame de Pompadour, who was small, she had the beauty of the time, this little round face, large, dark, grey-colored eyes. 
uh, they brought in the best um, ballet dancers uh, because dancing at the court was extremely important, not just dancing you know, with people, but performance dance. Um, she was um, coached by the best singers, by the, the, be the greatest writers. Um, she was taught to compose, she was taught to act, she was taught languages. So um, by the time that she was about 15 or 16, she was quite renowned. And it's at this moment that her godfather marries her off to his nephew. Right? Now, he didn't have any other children. He disowns all his other nieces and nephews and puts all his money on this one niece and nephew. And so she becomes Madame de Thiol. He buys a castle for her, a little chateau, coincidentally just near the royal hunting fields. Yes. So that every day when the king whizzes past on his horse, you know, it's, oops, he sort of bumps into Madame de Détail in, in the most delicious, beautiful outfits, in a, in a little blue carriage and so on. And so he sort of spied her or, originally. Now, while she is um, here, she also manages to make a name for herself as a salonniere, right? So uh, she has, maybe she doesn't have breeding, but she has beauty, she has esprit, and she will possibly sort of be someone who can continue this tradition of the first mistress um, as being cultured, sophisticated, and the Parisian par excellence. So she um, entertains at her, her salon people like Voltaire, who she will uh, champion uh, against problems that occur later on in the court, Diderot, uh, and uh, all of the, some of the great uh, writers as well. Now, um, the Dauphin is being married um, off to the uh, Infanta of Spain, and there is a, a, a yew tree ball held on the 17th, uh, 1745. Uh, now, the royal family um, arrives, as you do, dressed as a huge trees. Right? <laughs> so, um, it, this, is, this is a very, everyone else is just in these disguises, you know, like a monk or a, this is Madame de Pompadour um, as a shepherdess talking to a yew tree, and the idea was that you didn't know which yew tree was which, but of course everyone did because the king was taller and so on, or he had a few more twigs, or I'm not quite sure. Anyway, it's from this moment on um, that she uh, begins her liaison uh, with the king. He's absolutely infatuated. She um, is brought to court, but the real problem is, of course, she can't be the official mistress because she has to be presented at court and she has no standing. She's not an aristocrat. So she's a very clever woman. She's, um, she is now schooled. She, um, the Louis XV gets one of the senior ladies in waiting and the Duc de Choiseul to school her in how to move, how to curtsy, the kind of um, in and out language that you have at Versailles. You know, knocking a door, you scrape with your fingernail twice. You know, you, you don't use the same words as French is used. Uh, you lisp as well, so that it's basically impossible to understand what you're saying. All of these things you have to learn. And Louis XV finally prevails upon someone to be her sponsor. And the person he's going to prevail upon is the uh, Princess of Conti who was the daughter of Louise de La Valliere. Here's one of his first mistresses. Is anyone with me? Remember? Yeah. So she's, she's born stiff and she does nothing but gamble. She has immense debts and so her debts will be paid off if she will present Madame de Pompadour at, the, at court, which she does. And she is given a title so that she is not just, you know, Mrs. Poisson. Um, and she is given the marquisade of uh, Pompadour and the coat of arms to go with it. And so from then on, she is given um, uh, apartments uh, at Versailles. Now, she sets about with great finesse to address the main brief, I suppose, which was to enchant the king and to relieve his boredom. Right. And so she turns her many talents here into, into, into use. So she here, for example, she puts on performances at Versailles. It was an incredibly boring place. Uh, and there's just gossip, nastiness, maliciousness going on. And she actually puts on these plays 
in which which she choreographs, which she designs the the uh, the costume, uh, she dances and she sings and she acts. So it's an absolutely exhausting uh, timetable that she puts herself through. And she has rather fragile health; constantly has migraines. It isn't really all that sort of interested in in sex, and so she really only remains his mistress for five years. Uh, that sort of physical relationship finishes up to five years, but she manages to maintain her role as maîtresse en titre for almost 20. So it's a little bit like uh, Diane de Poitiers. Uh, and you're going to see that she, she manages to uh, change her role. She will become more as a minister of the arts and supply him um, with little floozies along the way. So in the meantime, she sets up uh, a whole structure of drama and opera and ballets and sets up uh, you know who can be in it who can write who can do these things actually has um, a theatre built at Versailles but also caters for this the king's desire for um, privacy uh, remember we've sort of actually seen what these rooms were like so she actually has built um, the petits appartements. And if you ever go to Versailles, you see these. You can go on a little tour. These small little rooms, which are behind the rooms uh, where the king was on display. And these rooms are now in a, a style which is associated with Madame de Pompadour called Rococo. Uh, Rococo coming for a word from a kind of rock and, and baroque, you know, uneven, um, interesting, and so on. So these are small little rooms uh, where the king can come in. And so every night after he's gone to visit the queen and sort of had a cup of coffee or whatever it is that he has with her, standing on one foot and on the next thinking, you know, I've only got five minutes to talk to her. You know, she was so boring. She, she all only wanted to play cards. Uh, and then he escapes the Madame de Pompadour's uh, rooms. And she is dressed in a different dress every night. Um, greets him with a little tinkling bell and every one of all his little intimate group of the in group appear and they sit down and he can actually relax in fact he even pours coffee himself can you imagine mm -hmm. uh, so um, and people sort of joke and actually don't take him on but the, the, all that sort of heaviness of, of Versailles and the mondanite disappear and this enchants the king. He, he actually wants to be a private citizen. Uh, so this then is the style, um, which is Rococo, which is a, um, influenced by the taste of Madame Pompadour. So it's very feminine, it's soft colors, as opposed to the colors, the stark colors that had reigned under Louis XIV. This is, um, I've, actually this is the Musée uh, Camondor, but it's, uh, this man actually collected Rococo and 18th century furniture. So this is what these rooms would have looked like. Um, small, intimate, ev the walls covered in paintings and these tight, this furniture which is now like conversation, the sort of frivolity, light pieces of furniture which can be moved around as opposed to great heavy pieces which are stuck in the corner, which was sort of exemplary of, of what it was like to be at Versailles. You know, you stood up you know, to, to attention all night. Whereas now, in these little rooms, um, the furniture can be moved around. It's of different kinds of woods. It's unusual ones like you know, holly or lemon or cherry, maple. Um, unusual styles, uh, often inlaid with uh, brass, uh, beautiful brass pieces or pieces of Sèvres. Um, and also, this is the beginning of marquetry. Becomes, it becomes very popular. And this idea of frivolity, again, the lightness and the um, movement of, and the sensuality um, of these pieces of furniture. They, they're no longer just functional, but they're beautiful as well. So here you have this, all this extraordinary um, artistry um, of, of inlay, which, for which um, Paris becomes famous again. Um, and also, of course, chinoiserie. And this is a perfect example of this sort of uh, furniture where you've got secret drawers and then you've got the uh, uh, marquetry as well uh, and the, the lap pieces of lacquer which have been taken off pieces that have been imported from China and put on a, a body of furniture which was constructed in Paris. But also she is um, 
this is the art of the time, you know, Fragonard, the swing, um, the lightness, the frivolity, the sensuality of the present moment, none of this heavy worry of duty and, and, and uh, formality. Um, this is, you know, frothiness of life. Here you've got this young woman being pushed by her old husband and going up in the swing, and there's the lover uh, here in the bushes looking um, up her, her dress. And of course, this is, this is at a time when you didn't have, wear underpants either. No, so, you know, it, and um, you've got Cupid here, you know, sort of, you know, you know don't, don't mention this, and the sort of very light um, lightness of the background. Now, Madame de Pompadour is going to paint herself into this kind of style. Um, if Louis XIV saw himself as Apollo, a powerful message of Apollo as being the creator um, of life, Apollo here um, is seen as a rather sort of a feat um, adolescent who's getting out of his chariot at night into the arms of, uh, of night. Uh, and uh, of course, who is, who is it? It's a, a portrait of Madame de Pompadour. So she begins, she uh, sort of symbolizes um, or is the epitome of this new style. Now, we here have um, a, uh, a representation of Madame de Pompadour absolutely at the height of her power. So she's ceased all sexual relationships with the king. She had a couple of um, miscarriages. She wasn't one of his natural breeders as the queen was. Uh, and she makes the most of this. You know, that's the queen's duty. And she's very, very careful to always be very respectful of poor old Queen Maria Lewinska uh, with her, you know, gambling and, and, you know, rosary beads. And the queen actually sort of says, well, you know, if I have to have a mistress of court, it's better her than anybody else. And so she is given the highest level um, at the court, which is the lady in waiting to the queen. All right. And this, is, this painting is made just after she's taken over this, this role. So here you get this painting with the curtains opening, you know, almost on an opera stage, to reveal this extraordinarily glamorous uh, woman uh, who is reclining ever so slightly in the uh, posture of, of Venus, you know, the goddess of love, but it's, uh, it's subverted this sort of slightly erotic tonality that you could read into it is, um, I suppose, almost cancelled out by the attributes that are sprinkled around her. So you have a, a beautiful woman who is not just beautiful, but intelligent, culture, cultured and sophisticated. Um, there's reference here to the fact that she is reading uh, the latest books. Uh, later, there are other paintings where you see she has the encyclopedia, you know, which is being written. She is a great patron of that and she has that there. She's obviously someone who uh, writes in, uh, as well, writes her own works, but also reference also to her political power that she can write in your favour. Um, interest in gardening. Um, over here we have a lie. She's interested in music. Um, up here we have a ref everything that in the painting means something. You have a Cupid here, uh, referring of course to her relationship to the king, uh, her own coat of arms that she has um, recently taken on as Madame Pompadour. Um, we have here a clock, and the time in in paintings on clocks is always important. It's, um, it's between vespers and dinner. In other words, it shows that she's just come in from being the lady of waiting uh, at vespers with the queen. And she has a moment now to withdraw from the mondanité, you know, the boring life of the court, into this intimate space. So what you have is a representation of the la belle savante, of the beautiful, learned lady, right? who um, is the intimate of the king uh, and almost a kind of prime minister in many ways. She constantly is advising him, but also operates as the uh, minister of the arts. Right? So she's managed to work uh, herself a, a position which is virtually unassailable, right? because it's no longer just youth and beauty that counts. 
um, it's this um, ability to represent the realm of France uh, to the outside world. Um, and she has huge power at court and uh, people come to her toilette. Right? This is when you actually came and asked you know, for a favour. And this is a very interesting painting. I, I haven't got time to, to, give it, to do it justice. But if you actually look at this, she is, it is Madame de Pompadour at her mirror and she is making herself up. If you actually think of the word make up, in other words, it's a construction of herself. And in fact, the painter has made it look as though she is an artist herself painting herself, that it's a self-portrait because she's not left-handed. However, got, she's got the brush in the left hand. So um, this is what happens, of course, when you've got a painter who is doing a self-portrait, it's all reversed. And it, so in other words, this idea of constructing her role, that it's, it's, it's Boucher actually sort of saying that he understands that it is she who constructs herself, that she is the power behind this image. But what she's actually doing, this is a time of great interest because she had, had now decided she wasn't having any sexual relationships with the king. People weren't sure about that. But um, she had now said that she's going to become extremely devout and once one became devout and stopped, you know, fooling around, um, one stopped wearing rouge. So every morning it was, is she going to rouge or is she not, right? Um, and the rouge, of course, was, was a very important marker of um, nobility. Uh, people who weren't nobles were not supposed to wear this, this rouge. Uh, uh, it wasn't supposed to make you look healthy. It was a sign of nobility. Once you, you came to the court, you had to wear that. But once you entered a religious, not order, but you know your soul was being purified, you abandoned these kinds of worldly conceits. So what the other thing that's interesting here um, is, when I forgot to tell you about it actually, in this one here, um, where she is very discreetly um, hiding uh, this uh, cameo, which is um, the she has actually made it herself. Well with the help of, you know, three artists, five engravers, and she probably said, look, put some pink on it or something. But anyway, she was supposed to have done it herself, uh, the cameo of the king, which she had discreetly turned around so that it couldn't be seen in the other uh, painting. You know, right? So her discreet relationship with the king. Here it is extremely um, obvious, uh, as you can see here, uh, displaying her relationship. Well, not everyone is, is happy um, about uh, the power that this woman has, uh, the power in politics, the power to promote her family, to promote the people who put her there in the first place. And so the gutter press bring, produces a whole lot of so-called poissonade, um, fish, fishmonger stories. And some of them are extremely vulgar, and I have I'm not shown them to you. <laughs> Keep it in mind. Well, particularly after the coffee, I'm hearing that it would be too much. <laughs> All right, so um, I want very briefly to look at um, how she contributes in a lasting way uh, to the glory of France and the culture of France. Uh, and this is with the development of the manufacture, manufacture at Sèvres. Uh, she gets Louis XIV uh, to buy the manufacture de Vincennes and has it moved to Sèvres. And then Sèvres, she does this on purpose, because Sèvres is just near uh, the royal hunting castle of uh, the Chateau de Saint-Cloud, uh, literally a kilometer away. Not even, not even that, not even that. It's a five minute walk. Um, so uh, basically he can't get out from her, her vision. And she is going to promote um, Sèvres as her initiative. Now, what she is very clever at doing is that uh, she's actually not interested in these things, but she's worked out what is it that the king is fascinated with, what are his hobbies. He wasn't interested in ruling, um, but he was, had been brought up with great interest in science and architecture, and so he was very interested in the process um, of trying the discovery or trying to discover hard paste porcelain. And so she gets on board with this and is the person who's going to be the entrepreneur. She's going to put the artists in place. She's going to make it um, an extremely flourishing uh, affair. Um, and I think, it's take, I think it will be in 19, uh, 1777 that the, the 
key to hard paste is finally found with violin. Um, but Madame de Pompadour will pay um, scientists and chemists from everywhere to come and work on this. So in the meantime, uh, once a month, the king and most of the court go to see what Save have produced. And the aristocrats, when they give a gift, uh, have to give everyone a piece of porcelain. So Christmas was not really exciting. You had a wonderful big parcel and you opened it up. Oh, oh, a piece of sap. Everyone had a different piece of sap. So um, she guaranteed that these pieces would circulate and would eventually, of course, you know, once you've had you know, 13 cups and saucers, you probably um, sent them over to relatives overseas. And so the glory of sap spread. She's also responsible for the constant change. Um, she employs the best artists. Here, Boucher, these um, are, are based either on Boucher or, or Fragonard or Pigalle. And then they experiment with all these different colours. So here we have the wonderful blue. Uh, here, very, very Baroque, as you can see, um, with the potpourri. Mm -hmm. I, I won't sort of spend too much time on this, just to sort of show you the variety that extraordinary impulsion which is given via the patronage of the royal favourite. Um, so these, with these elephant heads, we're you know, referring to sort of exoticism, but then of course the little, we'll call them the cartouche, um, again obviously of Boucher with the little angels here, uh, and a potpourri, which is very important because of everything that's not ghastly uh, at Versailles. But since everybody smelled ghastly, it didn't matter so much. All right, um, again, we're now getting into Pompadour Pink, uh, and uh, the next mistress will try and also um, copy and, and impose her pink, we'll see in a moment. Um, this again, the uh, Sèvres uh, work was uh, developed to uh, refer to victories. Look, I'll just go through this quickly. Um, by 65, you get the dark blue, uh, you get exquisite pieces which are made. This was made for um, um, marronier, um, chestnuts, the sugared chestnuts, and Madame de Pompidou didn't like getting her fingers dirty, so you actually had these little holes so that all the syrup would, would run through. Now, these are all still in soft porcelain, in other words, they can't be heated and they break very easily. Um, this is one that she had made when she was uh, ill. Uh, this would be a little kind of candle would go in here, there'd be water heated there, and an egg could be cooked there, which is why you have a chalk. So really, very sweet. And also you had perfume coming out as well. Now, um, she didn't just um, um, contain herself to the pieces for the table. She also employed Pigard, who was one of the great sculptors of the time, and had him make small and large pieces, small pieces for the table. I think at her death she had something like 2,000 little, little pieces of what's called biscuit work. Now, what she has done here um, is she's asked him to do love embracing friendship or friendship embracing love. And this is how she now has fashioned herself. She is the friend of the king, right? She's no longer, you know, just his, you know, his mistress, but she is his friend, his confidant, uh, the person who is representing the arts in France. And she has paintings done of herself at this time with that statue in the background. You see friendship embracing little Cupid here, um, emphasis on the little dog of, of showing her sort of fidelity. Still absolutely beautiful and desirable, but absolutely beyond that sort of thing. And here we have another one by Pigalle with friendship. Um, actually, it's the queen offering her heart to the king, right? So that's, that is what she offers him, uh, not the rest. And she says, love is a pleasure which lasts but a season, whereas friendship lasts a whole life. And indeed, this is what she endeavoured to do, and she achieved this. Now, um, she achieved this in many ways by um, controlling um, who he then um, actually frolicked uh, with. And there was in the grounds of Versailles, I think called the La Maison à Serf, the, uh, the stag's house, where um, young girls who were thought to be the king's type, like the Morceau de la Reine that she originally had been, but not cultured, etc., just his physical type, um, were brought in and uh, he would, you know, have liaisons with them. 
this was one of the most one who one who almost challenged uh, Madame de Pompadour. Uh, she was very young; I mean, she was only about sixteen, but that didn't seem to matter in those days. Um, and she uh, is quite important to the king. She uh, finally has a child with her, whom he legitimises. Um, meantime, she also promotes herself. The king likes gardening, so he pro she promotes herself as the, the gardener. All right, and here all of these different flowers mean you know, faithfulness, interest, and so on. So um, positioning herself very well. Well, in the meantime, um, she has decided also with her brother, who has now become the, holds the position more or less of chief architect of Paris, and all of this is bankrolled by her godfather, who now are completely in power of the purse strings, and they set up the Place de la Concorde, Louis, the Place Louis XV, which is Place de la Concorde. So many of the place, parts of Paris that we have now, um, we owe to uh, Madame de Pompadour. Uh, she wanted to have uh, a say uh, in the structure of Paris. So she was someone who, you know, was quite had, saw the big picture. Um, she also establishes the Ecole Militaire, which you know is near the um, Eiffel Tower, and of course she does this to. Um, put herself on the same footing with Madame de Madanon. Remember last week who established the Ecole de Saint-Cyr for the uh, impoverished young women. Right. Well, this is to produce an officer caste. So it's actually very useful for the king and for Madame de Pompadour who now has a handle on who is going to be promoted into the army. Right. So, uh, backed by these powerful family members who have immense wealth, she now has her hand on the arts and, and the army. Very clever woman. Uh, she, she has something like 12 or 14 palaces by the time she dies. This is now the Elysee Palace that we saw uh, Francois Hollande sneaking out of. Um, the Petit Trianon um, also is built for her, and that is something to remember when we're talking about Marie Antoinette. Well, um, all good things come to an end, and uh, here we have her, I think she's going to die at the age of 42, um, the, a painting by uh, Van Loo with the arts. Um, here we have painting, uh, I think we've got uh, music, uh, architecture, probably sculpture over here, um, imploring fate who is about to snip, you know, there's the three fates who, who weave your destiny and at the time of your death one of them has cut the thread and Father, even Father Time himself is looking distraught and sort of saying don't do it, um, you know, they're imploring that her life continue. So uh, she, how has this woman who's a bourgeois got to this position, it's really quite amazing. Anyhow, this is the last painting that we have of her as she's now positioning herself no longer as that triumphant, slightly Venus-like <laughs> glamorous figure. Even though she's only 42, she looks, she's trying to look like a good-looking grandma. Um, she uh, is someone who no longer receives at her toilet, but now receives at her um, tapestry frame. That's sort of even more um, uh, respectable. Uh, and she sort of, you know, her hair is powdered grey and so on. And uh, she dies quite gracefully um, when she's given the final rites. The, the uh, confessor says, well, I'm going to go now. She says, no, Monsieur le Curé, we'll go out together. So she dies, and her body has to be removed very, very quickly from Versailles because no body can remain there. The king, however, is, is seems to sort of shed a tear, you know, which was unusual, and is, is actually quite distraught for, I think it's, probably, just have a look, 63, 43, it's probably about a year. Mm. <laughs> yeah, about, well, it is that, anyway. And so we now get the reign of Madame du Barry. So he has already gone down to promote a bourgeois as first mistress, but now he makes the real error. You know, he's someone who is extremely self-indulgent, and he's got used to uh, having these young girls supply, he's got very used to having Madame de Pompadour, you know, work his life out for him. Uh, and so he allows himself to be lured into this relationship um, by another camp, 
uh, in, the, in the Royal Court. Uh, this time it's the Duc de Richelieu, right? not Cardinal Richelieu, but a relative, the Duc de Richelieu, who um, discovers this woman who is really Jeanne Bécu, and she's the daughter of a seamstress, uh, the illegitimate daughter of a seamstress and a monk or something. Um, and one of the mother's lovers actually puts her in a convent, so she learns to read and write, but she gets out of there, comes up to Paris and works as basically in um, a haberdashery shop. And working in a haberdashery shop was code for being a prostitute. Uh, as you can see here, you can see with the tail of this uh, little dog, what really is happening, you know what I mean? This is it's basically a kind of a, a front for a kind of upmarket brothel. So she actually doesn't work the streets, but she is discovered by a monsieur who refers to himself as Monsieur Dubarry, who sees in her um, someone whom he, she's very beautiful, he can present to some of his aristocratic uh, customers. The Duc de Richelieu meets her, realizes that he's just the, she's just the sort of thing that the king would like. So she is presented to the king, but before she can actually become the king's mistress, she has to be married off, so she marries her pimps. Uh, uh, brother and assumes <coughs> the false name of uh, Comtesse de Bari. He had no title, it was just made up. So the king's a little bit embarrassed, you know, uh, there's this beautiful woman, uh, what is she he going to do with her if he can't have her as his official mistress? And so he um, prevails on yet another bankrupt. The courtiers now are horrified. I mean, she really is ghastly. Uh, and uh, sort of giggles and, and can't make, you know, get to the end of a, a sentence or a conversation, but the king doesn't notice that. Uh, and finally finds an incredibly bankrupt uh, uh, aristocrat who, who uh, in return for having all of their debts wiped out, will present her at court. And she arrives in a, in a dress of best pass of all taste, you know, can imagine gold and silver dripping in diamonds, virtually trips over, but it doesn't matter. Uh, she's been presented at court and away they go. Now, she then tries to ape Madame de Pompadour. She sort of tries to be interested in, 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 in porcelain and tries to introduce a new pink. You know, she always wears pink, so therefore you get, you get Dubali pink. Um, they have a rather difficult time trying to promote her as anything but a kind of common uh, uh, prostitute. But the king is utterly, utterly besotted. I don't know whether it, he's 60 and she's about 20. Uh, he gives her beautiful uh, castles, but in particular, um, he's going to give her this um, set of jewellery, which is going to have great repercussions for Marie Antoinette. Um, he commissions um, this wonderful necklace of, of diamonds. It would have cost the equivalent of, I think it's about 16 million pounds now, you can imagine. And this is at a time when we're going towards the French Revolution. Uh, extraordinary extravagance. However, she doesn't ever get it because the king dies of smallpox and everyone breathes a sigh of relief and she is exiled. Um, Marie Antoinette, who takes over, hates her, as we'll see, and sends her off uh, to a convent. She escapes from the convent and goes to live in her chateau, where she lives about another 15 years until... <laughs> she's so stupid. Um, she then... The revolution has taken place and someone steals her diamonds, so she goes to the revolutionary government and lodges a complaint that her diamonds have been stolen. I mean, really. So, uh, and in the meantime, she'd been back and forth from London several times, so the revolutionary government, who actually hadn't noticed her until then, so suddenly think, right, uh, and arrest her, and she's taken struggling and screaming to the scaffold. Now, um, in all of the executions that had taken place, the aristocracy had kept their sang-froid and their dignity, whereas this woman creates an incredible scene, and Madame Vichy de Brun sort of says, Madame du Barry is the only woman among all the women who perished in the dreadful days who could not stand the sight of the scaffold. She screamed, she begged mercy of the horrible crowd that stood around the scaffold. She aroused them to such a point that the executioner grew anxious and hastened to complete his task. This convinced me that if the victims of these terrible times had not, had not been so proud, had not met death with such courage, the terror would have ended much earlier. Men of limited intelligence lack the imagination to be touched by inner suffering, and the populace is more easily stirred by pity <coughs> than by admiration. Now, this is written by uh, Madame du uh, de Bonin, who had painted her portrait several times. And here she is struggling on her way to the scaffolding, and she's supposed to have said, 
as the, you know, he's put under the scaffold, one more minute, please, monsieur, the you know, executioner. And here's someone else who actually says, when she felt the cold touch of steel on her neck, giving her a foretaste of the horror to come, and she saw her lovely golden curls barely streaked with grey lying on the dusty floor, the woman who had once been the beautiful Dubarry finally collapsed into a pathetic, whimpering creature, dead to all sense of dignity and shame. So that was the end of her. Now, what is now going to occur is a legacy, in many ways, of the behaviour um, of Louis XV. So Louis XV's son, the Dauphin, dies, and his grandson, the really very, very shy, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a sort of a characteristic of the Bourbon, uh, possibly because of their upbringing at court, but they are shy, um, secretive, melancholy people. And this, the Dauphin, who suddenly becomes king, is indeed like that. Now, he is, of course, married to Marie Antoinette, the last queen, the last queen. And she is the queen, and we remember her because we sort of see her uh, immortalised by the sweep of the guillotine, right, in her sort of diamond youth, this is how we remember her. But um, the fascination with Marie Antoinette um, doesn't date just simply uh, as, as a posthumous phenomenon. But during her own lifetime, she was the object of sort of desire and hatred uh, and uh, managed a life between fact and fiction. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the construction of Marie Antoinette in the gutter press <coughs> and how it is the Marie Antoinette of the gutter press who is going to be executed finally uh, at the... At, uh, at the guillotine, right, for other reasons than, than simply being dangerous, all right? There was no need to execute the Queen. Now, she was someone who was fascinated with <coughs> her own glamour, very much like sort of movie stars that we have today, and she used the great sort of court of Louis the 15th, Louis the 16th, which was a court of spectacle, but she shrinks it to her own personal presentation and so um, attempts to act as an individual, which of course was not what a queen was supposed to do. A queen was simply a subject, was simply someone who served the monarchy and her individuality was dangerous. She represented the king or she represented the interests of the country she's born in, but she was not supposed to have a persona. And Marie Antoinette fights all of the factions at court by imposing herself with style and becoming a fashion icon. Uh, and once she left this sort of immutable, uh, eternal values of the monarchy behind and fell into modernity and fashion, which changes every day, she lost the prestige and the raison d'etre of the monarchy and allows it to become disposable, which indeed it will. So Marie Antoinette then is the last maîtresse en titre and the last queen. She's a maîtresse en titre because Louis XVI didn't have a mistress, and so she plays the role of the mistress, the big spender, uh, the glamorous person who dazzles, which was not the role of the queen. Now, she um, starts her life out at court. Um, it was supposed to be her sister who was to marry uh, uh, Louis the uh, 16th. Her mother, M Maria Theresa of Austria, uh, had, uh, I think she had 16 children, and she was queen uh, in Austria. She, she actually led the army. She was the person who had the power. It was quite different from in France, where a female cannot inherit the throne, it's called the Salic Law. Uh, so Maria Theresa, in between the military campaigns, had 16 children, uh, all of whom were married off into various alliances, which is one of the reasons why Austria becomes very powerful at that time. Uh, and when Maria and Josepha actually dies, uh, they rummage around in the nursery and find that they have the last uh, daughter, Maria Antonia. Now, um, it was a very relaxed court, there were so many children, that meant that she had not been given a satisfactory upbringing. 
she had been left by herself. Her personality had been allowed to develop uh, as an individual, I, I suppose. She'd been lost amongst this brood um, and wasn't, hadn't been schooled in the, I, the uh, ideas of importance of, of, of behaving as a monarch. So when she becomes uh, engaged to this poor, frightened uh, young man, um, emissaries are sent to the court. They try and teach her French. They try and teach her manners. They teach her to dance. They teach her. Um, they straighten her teeth, which must have been painful before. Uh, An aesthetic. Um, her hair is, is done in the French way, and, and so on. And she's groomed to become the French queen. So when she actually crosses the border from Austria into France, there's and the same thing happened with all queens. There is a crossover point where she is with her retinue on one side of this middle point and the front French are with their retinue on the other side. She steps across to the other side and she is stripped physically of her clothes. Everything's taken off, everything, absolutely. And then from the bottom up, she is turned into a French person via her clothes. So in other words, um, the body of the queen uh, and what she wears um, is an essential part in the sort of definition of Frenchness. All right, so she, all of these extraordinary robes that she had were thrown out, and she can only wear things that are French. So she arrives at the French at the French court, and immediately there's a few problems. There's all these factions, bitchy factions. The first faction is, of course, these sisters of Louis, uh, the children of Louis the Fifteenth. Right, these are her great aunts who are there. Um, who haven't married, uh, who are sort of gossipy old things, and they grab little Maria Antonia and try and make an ally out of her. And they want to make an ally out of her against Madame du Barry, right? Um, who, of course, uh, Marie Antonia is, uh, Marie Antoinette by now, is, is, is horrified to find out that she's, she's just a prostitute who's been brought in. Uh, and so she refuses to speak to her. And for two and a half years, she just looks straight through her and refuses. And this, is, this brings terrible problems to the court. So her mother has to be contacted by the ambassador. So Maria uh, and Marie Antoinette finally, on one New Year's Eve, manages to say to the gritted teeth to Madame du Barry, there's a lot of people here tonight. Uh, and that is enough to break the ice. Everyone's relieved about that. All right, so you've got Madame du Barry's not just a gibbering idiot. Um, she also has her uh, power base as well, who are working actively against the power base on, of the sisters. And in the midst of this, of course, you have the king's brothers, uh, one of whom, Charles X, thinks that he really would make a much better king than his doddering older brother, and indeed he did when he came to power. Then you've got the cousins of the king, also who think the Orléans branch really um, basically has a much greater branch because these people are descended through bastards and so on. Um, so there's this hotbed of discussion. Uh, on top of this, she has of course been brought to the court to um, produce an heir and uh, nothing happens for seven years. Um, Louis XIV, for one reason or another, which I won't go into here, um, first of all isn't particularly interested, um, but secondly can't do it either. Uh, and has to finally, uh, Marie Antoinette's brother, the King of Austria, has to come down and have a long chat with him, and things get better after that. But it took them seven years to have the chat. But in the meantime, she's really very humiliated. She's supposed to have produced an heir straight away. Everyone knows that nothing goes on because um, Versailles is constructed with the King's bedroom here and on the other wing, the Queen, and the courtiers are in the middle. So everyone knows, you know, he goes back and he goes forth and back, oh, he's back five minutes, you know. So everyone knows what's going on, and she's humiliated. So she decides to fight all of this with style, with refusal, and being her own rebellious person. Uh, this, of course, is uh, this um, uh, etiquette that she hated. You know, didn't have this in, in Vienna, uh, where you get up and someone gives you your chemise, someone higher up in rank knocks on the door, and the chemise goes all the way back to the higher rank. You're just about to get it for freezing cold, and someone else comes in and it goes all the way back to the person. And it, it, it sometimes took half an hour for her to get one piece of clothing on. Uh, so she really decided that she was going to do something about this. She rebels in ways that all are basically related to something that she can actually manipulate, and that is her own body and uh, the covering of her body, which is her hair and her clothes. 
So the first rebellion is that she refuses to wear the grand uh, corps. Cor. Um, members of the royal family had to wear a corset that was actually made of, of, of metal, which was incredibly uncomfortable, uh, and you couldn't ride in it. So she refuses to wear this, and this is a scandal because everyone can see it because at the Louvre they know what she's got on, everyone knows everything about her. So it gets back finally to the, her queen, uh, her mother, who finally gets the ambassador to prevail upon her to wear the Grand Corps. She also insists on going out, designing her own riding outfits, so that she can actually go out riding with Louis XV, who, whose ear she wants to have. And she also sets herself up a little bit, or not exactly as a rival to Madame du Barry, but as the, the clever, sweet rival of Madame du Barry. So she can always have him to herself when she's out riding. And she rides uh, not side saddle. So this, again, is absolutely scandalous. I mean, this was known to be ghastly for your complexion and dreadful for um, childbearing. So then they thought that this is why she couldn't have any children, because she'd been riding astride a horse. All right, so we'll have to whiz through this a little bit. She does, however, does a few things which are right. She actually has her portrait taken here, which will be very different from the most scandalous portrait that we'll see in a moment. Here she has herself gazed upon by the king. She's upright. She has yards of material, admittedly, but the royalty was supposed to be grand, right, uh, and to have, you know, obviously a lot of people had worked on supporting you and making you look like this. Now, um, the second fashion rebellion was the Pouf and Rosa Bertin. Now, Marie Antoinette got incredibly bored um, at Versailles, constantly went to Paris, where she met um, Rose Bertin, who had one of these first little um, shops that sold uh, laces and bits and pieces. She was a dressmaker who was sort of cutting edge uh, worked for the ladies who lived in Paris, the Salonnière, and Marie Antoinette takes her on as her private um, dressmaker, and so she ends up coming to court to the has the, you know the uh, audiences with the king, uh, with the queen, um, possibly two or three times a week because she had an immense number of gowns being made, and the courtiers hate this because you've now got some common tradesperson coming taking up the time with, that they should have. I mean, they've abandoned their estates, they're, they're bored stiff at court. Their only reason they're there is to be in the presence of the Queen, and there she is with this um, marchand de, de, de dentelle. And it is Rose Bertin who is going to encourage her with these ridiculous hairdos, which are called the poofs. All right, so um, this is made out of cushioning underneath here, um, and it is sustained by plaster of Paris and by flour and water. And uh, they look absolutely ridiculous, and they, they were. That meant that um, they were very impractical. But also, um, Marie Antoinette sponsors the idea of having hairdos which reflect daily events, right? So instead of being reflecting the eternal nature, the immutable nature of monarchy, the divine right of kings, she's sort of like a newspaper um, <laughs> insofar as what, really, literally, what has she got on her head today? Um, oh, this one is because the French Navy, uh, La Valpoule, had actually defeated one of the um, English ships in the American War of Independence. So she put this um, ship on her head. Right, and would walk around like that probably for a week. The next week, um, it would be advertising the fact that Louis the XVI uh, had had the inoculation against smallpox, so she'd have a whole lot of needles, uh, you know, inoculated. So, or she'd have some kind of flower, or different kind of flowers, and she'd have little, um, little things that actually had water that you could squeeze and the, the water the flowers, and very, very complex. Um, and it was copied throughout France and throughout Paris in particular. So people now copy the Queen. You know, she's not someone who just sits in her own apartments and prays. She's now, you know, a fashion icon. You know, she's, who, who could you possibly do it? Not brave, you know, Angelina Jolie, but something like that. So this is the sort of um, uh, publications which would um, show these hairdos. Now, these hairdos were, as you can see, absolutely preposterous. 
Um, you couldn't sleep at night. Someone would have to actually get up um, on a step ladder and cover it over. Of course, it was terribly bad for you because it had vermin uh, would, would develop in it. Uh, fleas, not exactly mice, but I mean it was almost at, at that stage. They were so impractical that you couldn't actually get into a carriage. You had to sort of kneel in the carriage or you had to have your head out the window. Um, and here you had one which actually had springs in it. So if you visited your elderly relatives who were scandalised by your hair, you actually had springs that you could pull down. It was called la coiffure à la grand-mère. So when you went to visit grandma, you, you pulled it down by this star. Now, her mother was absolutely exasperated by this. And she says, in the same way, I can't prevent myself raising a point which many gazettes, you see, she's now the subject of the press, right, writing about what is the queen wearing today, what is she doing, repeat all too often, it's the coiffure you use. They say that from the forehead up, it is 36 inches high, and with so many feathers and ribbons to adorn it. You know that I've always thought that fashion should be followed moderately without ever exaggerating them. A young and pretty queen who's full of attractions doesn't need all these follies. On the contrary, the simplicity of your adornment will show you off better and is more suitable to the rank of a queen. All right, so she actually had understood it very well. I'll just have to leave that. So this, when fashion plates are now produced in the press, um, they are on a kind of doll-like what would you call plate of Marie Antoinette so if you're advertising a kind of dress it's always put on this figure which is a Marie Antoinette figure so she has become a vulgarised version uh, of fashion uh, dolls were made of her and ex you know, exported as well now um, there are several things that I actually want to get at here the Petit Trianon of course um, had been made for the king's mistress, Madame de Pompadour. Louis the, it hadn't been completed. Louis the Sixteenth hasn't got a mistress, has he? So he gives it to his wife. And so all of the sort of idea of the mistress, the tainted idea of the mistress, is going to be used by Marie Antoinette. Now, this is where she is going to go and create this idea of the simple life. Now, she desperately um, wanted to get away from court, uh, wanted to get away from all of these factions, and so disappears to the Trianon, creates her own little farm and little village there, and attempts to live the simple life. Now, it wasn't just, you know, out of a whim. She was following a fashion which had been come through the works of Rousseau, you know, uh, Paul et Virginie, and so on, the idea of return to simplicity, return to nature, but she only uh, took the very superficial elements that pleased her. And so um, designs, or gets Rose Bertin to design um, clothes which are à la Rousseau, which reflect the simplicity of life at the Trianon. Uh, and uh, of course this creates an absolute scandal. Uh, the, these look like underwear. This is the chemise that people used to wear under those elaborate sort of crinoline-like gowns. Uh, and uh, this is, will, will be uh, very important later. So the idea is to dress simply, no longer to have those poofs, to have the simple hair, to have the simple uh, flowers, and to, to live a simple life. Now, this is scandalous in itself, because the whole point of the Queen is supposed to be on show. She belongs to France um, as part of an institution. She can't just whiz off and have an individual life. So it's again Marie Antoinette trying to be an individual when that is not the role that she was signed up for. So she goes off, spends weekends in, a, in this little Trianon, which had been built for a royal mistress, and takes with her a little coterie of friends. And the other courtiers are furious because, as I've said before, they've spent their fortunes sitting there they cannot be advanced in their life unless they see the queen, unless they see the king, unless they, you know, they're in their their um, their company. And so, without the king and the queen, what is the point of Versailles? What is the point of having a court? Not only um, is it seen favoritism; everybody wants to be one of the favourites, whereas it's only this small group of people. But because I can't see what goes on, in fact, you have mirrors that come down to sort of so you can't see in. 
um, people then built up this idea of all these unbelievable orgies and licentiousness and goes on. And so the Queen's best friend, La Duchesse de Polignac, becomes, is supposed now to be a lesbian lover. Uh, here you have sort of, um, in the gutter press, you've got painting, well, this is one of the better ones, the others I thought were not for your tender eyes. Um, what goes on, all of these, the most unnatural sort of sexual practices go on in private, because after all, this is a mistress's little castle. Uh, and also, they're very suspicious of um, a man called Alex Fersen, uh, who's a very handsome uh, Swedish uh, count, who was the ambassador at the court, who'd known Marie Antoinette, met her several times. And it is now considered that he is quite possibly the father um, of the little dauphin who will die uh, in the tower. Right? Um, it's been thought for quite some time that they clearly had some relationship. One of the reasons it points to it is that he, when the king and queen are actually imprisoned um, in, in Paris and they decide to escape to Varennes, you, you all know about that, it is Fersen who orchestrates it. Uh, uh, but the queen, of course, wants to have all her dresses. She's been having someone make dresses for six months, which is a dead giveaway. They have to be in a, in a carriage, which is incredibly heavy. Uh, to carry all the clothes, which means it moves very slowly. Marie Antoinette gets lost getting out of her apartments and getting to the, into the carriage. She gets, so that's half an hour late. Person had actually organised that the horses be changed at certain posting points. The carriage took so long and was so late that the people at the posting points thought, oh, they must have gone another way and disappeared. Uh, and that is why they are caught at Varen. So it's now thought that he, he clearly had a stake uh, in uh, getting the royal family to escape together because, in fact, it was his son. And the reason why that this is thought is that up until now they have actually had no um, evidence in the letters that have been exchanged between him and Marie Antoinette. They're all very affectionate and interesting and there are accounts in court so they couldn't take their eyes off each other and everything. But um, now at the Bibliothèque Nationale they've developed um, technology uh, which can um, distinguish a lot of the... Um, writing, the letters have come down very effectively, whole passages scrubbed out with ink. And this particular machine can measure the um, amounts of copper in the two different inks, uh, because one was the scrubbing out was quite possibly a number of years later, and therefore can actually read now what is underneath the scrubbing out. And it is perfectly clear that they were um, in some kind of, of well, they were in, a, in a, an intimate relationship. So it's, it's very interesting how technology uh, changes the course of history. Um, now, by this stage, uh, I'm going to have to go on for 10 minutes. Is, is that all right? Uh, uh, she is being now reviled. The, the, the gutter press now has got hold of her. She is produced as a harpy. Uh, here we have a play on her name, Autrichienne, an Austrian, or is she some kind of Autrichienne, an ostrich? All right, but she looks like one of the harpies out of hell, out of um, mythology. And this gutter press is a total fiction, um, and it constructs an idea of Marie Antoinette um, as incestuous. She's supposed to be having an affair with her brother-in-law, um, she's also supposed to be a lesbian uh, with a couple of ladies in waiting. She's also a nymphomaniac. Uh, she is supposed to be, uh, you know, squandering the king's jewels and all the rest of it. In other words, diminishing the role and the standing of the king. And this, um, every week, as in the gutter press, to get it sold, Mar this character of Marie Antoinette, which is totally different from the reality has to get worse to sell, right? So that by the time she's executed, she's going to be executed as this <coughs> fictional, <coughs> horrible person who has been produced by the gutter press. Um, basically a powerful woman who has to be pulled down. So at uh, least these are the gutter press. Now, this is a painting which is extremely important. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it. Um, a great mistake. She had no sense of the dangerous areas that she was steering the monarchy and herself into. She thinks that she is now, you know, 
launched this fashion um, of the simplicity because afterwards she'd been criticised for the um, complexity of her gowns. But royalty was supposed to have large pieces that could be shown that, you know, were obviously different from the populace. They were supposed to be bright colours. Uh, whereas now she's appearing in these chemises, horror upon horrors, the material from these chemises is imported from England. So not only are we dealing with the enemy, um, the silk mills and all of the industries of luxury in France are not being patronised. Um, not only that, but now everybody is copying her. So bourgeois ladies now can dress like the Queen. Um, not that there are, the colours aren't being used, she's using all these new colours, she invents colours, for example, when the Dauphin is, is born, she invents a colour which is the Dauphin's poo, that's a nice sort of brown, and then you get um, puce, which is a squashed uh, flea, uh, puce, and that's where you get puce from, uh, and or you get sugared la reine, you know, a kind of champagne colour and so on, so all these beautiful glowing colours, which, you know, represented France and artists, these dragged out things that any kind of um, servant could wear. But as Dolly Parton says, you know, it costs them millions to look this cheap. You know, <laughs> really. uh, so she's very sort of carefully done. But not only that, so she now, at the Louvre, uh, when they actually have exhibitions of paintings, very rarely uh, sort of open um, to the public, this is before the Salon, uh, she has this painting exhibited amongst other paintings um, with, uh, you know, truth, getting rid of vice, um, the goddess Juno dispensing justice, you know, all of these high-minded historical stuff, and the queen in her, what is considered her underwear. So this is a major scandal. Not only, she has no idea of monarchy, she is just a, a sort of a trumped up, you know, Slut, I suppose. Uh, all sh this is the queen of the Trianon, the queen of all that vice, the queen who is really a mistress. Worse than that, she's holding up a rose, which is the symbol of the Habsburgs. Uh, and so you see, she's not even French, is she? You know, she's all what she's plotting. Totally forgetting that all the queens, of course, weren't French, right? But the idea is that she's still plotting um, and still an Austrian at heart. Catastrophe. Within six months, another version is painted where the hairdo has changed. She's gone for a modified poof. Um, she's in a beautiful court outfit uh, wearing the jewels. All right. Now, she asked uh, Vigée Le Brun to actually paint uh, portraits of her which represent the traditional role of the queen, the queen as mother of the children of France. Unfortunately, and this is interesting, this necklace is going to resurface. Now, um, it had lain that the people who had had it commissioned didn't know what to do with it because the king, uh, Louis XV, had died. And there is a descendant of Henry II, one of the, whom we mentioned in the first lecture, who is a kind of, she's a, a prostitute, but also a kind of a, a networker. And she got the ear of um, the Duc de Richelieu, who had been frozen out by Marie Antoinette and she sort of said, look, the way to get her would, you know, to be sympathetic to you is to um, offer her this necklace, you know, and I know she wants it. And he said, are you sure she wants it? And he said, she said, yes, look, I know the Queen. I'm an intimate of the Queen. Um, I will get a letter from her. So there's a forged letter which goes to him um, saying, yes, yes, oh, thank you so much. I'd be very interested in, in the necklace meet me in the forest so he actually meets her and sees a woman in that one of these sort of um, shepherdess petticoat outfits holding a rose as you do in the middle of the night and so he thinks yes it's the queen yes i'll buy the necklace so he pays for it the in-between person buys the neck uh, gets the necklace from the jewelers uh, and uh, with the promissory notes goes off to england and disperses the diamonds and when when the uh, Duke de Richelieu comes to get it, it's, it's not there. So he asks the Queen, well, what's happened to all this? She says, I know nothing about it. Meanwhile, this has all been leaked through the gutter press. Mm -hmm. And even though she is completely innocent, I mean, even her signature is clearly not hers, and it had been wrongly signed, it had been Marie Antoinette de France, which she never signed that way, um, it, it sticks. And so this becomes the notorious 
necklace of the Queen, which Dumas actually writes one of his great novels about. So again, added to the fact that she's sexually sort of predatory, uh, bi, tri, quattro, gender, or whatever it is, um, she's squandering um, the wealth of France. I won't then sort of go through what happens to her. You know that she's imprisoned in, in the tower. Uh, her little boy is taken away from her. Um, she gradually has all her clothes taken. She, by now, um, has some dreadful affliction, uh, some gynecological affliction. Her hair um, at the night of Varenne is supposed to have actually gone white overnight. I mean, that's hard to believe, but there are written testimonies of her ladies-in-waiting that she was grey with horror the next morning. Um, she has all her rings, she has not even a little bit of mirror to, to dress herself in, but she manages to, to secrete away um, for her final day. She knows that she will be tried in um, um, a beautiful white dress. Now, she is brought before the Revolutionary Tribunal, and the last thing that they accuse her of is of incest with her own son, all right, this poor little nine-year-old, who had been taken from her, beaten to an extent where he'd admitted, yes, his mother had done all these things to him. And she actually turns to the um, revolutionary women who are in there and sort of appeals to them and says, as a mother, you know this is false, and there's utter silence, and then sort of the usual cat calling. And Robespierre is, is furious, you know, she's actually managed to um, galvanise this crowd of, of riffraff, and he immediately um, has her taken out and, and prepared for execution. So, uh, as she goes to, to be executed, um, she is glimpsed uh, by a young painter, uh, Jacques Louis David, of course, who will make his way as the painter of the Revolution, the painter of Napoleon, the painter of uh, the Restoration. Uh, but he, in this sketch of what was once a beautiful woman, taken to her execution. Now, what is interesting about the Queen was that she had no official function anymore. There was no need to execute the Queen. The King had died, the monarchy had gone, she was just his wife. She had no real status in her own right. There was no need to execute her. But she was executed and humiliated in a way that the king hadn't been. When he was taken to his execution, he was in a carriage covered over. She was exhibited in a tumbrel with her hair cut uh, with this, uh, you know, her last white gown. And so, as I said before, she was not really executed as the Queen of France in many ways, but as a powerful woman who had stepped outside her role and really who basically had to be removed um, as a symbol of what happens when women get too much power. So this is the way I want to, you to remember Marie Antoinette. <laughs> Thank you very much.